Good afternoon, everyone. A good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Dover Modern Palace in the King and Queen. And it's almost two years since our first gig here, so we're glad to celebrate our anniversary. Um, Hallow venue. This has been in its time a folk club as well. And uh, um, there's a picture up there on the wall. Certainly, Mr. Bob Dylan performed in this very spot in 1962. He walked in here, the organiser said, would you like to do an open mic spot, young man? And he said, no, I'll just sit in the back and listen. But come the interval, he was tempted and he got up and he sang computer three songs, including Blowing in the Wind. So um, that's a bit of a history. And uh, tell you a little bit about the venue. Um, there's a loo along the corridor here. That's more arcane knowledge there. Um, the show is going to finish this afternoon about five. We're going to have some open mic readers, of course, in each half. Well, we're delighted to have as our two feature poets, poets, the return of Anne Vaughan Williams, and also Eleanor Seven Oscar, who is new to Dodo, so a debut here this afternoon. So, um, and I should also say, there's a reason for this bucket. The lovely landlord doesn't charge us rent for using the venue, but he does ask us to ask you if you could put some change yeah. in this bucket for Macmillan's nurses, so uh, I'll just leave it over here, so if you could remember to do that if you have some loose change. Um, so, uh, I think that's all you need to know for now. Um, I'm going to kick off the open mic spots with um, a couple of poems. One is, uh, both Pete and I were amongst the one million on Saturday, and so this is a poem um, I wrote after listening to two children on the radio discussing the referendum, and it's called The Kids Are All Right. <laughs> what continent are we in? Are we welcome in France, in Spain? Or must we settle for British rain and British food and Britons being rude to anyone who isn't them? A prospect too grim to contemplate. Teacher says we mustn't hate anyone without good reason. But it seems like open season to challenge strangers in the street instead of offering a friendly greet. I don't want to stay when I am grown. You can keep this sad place you call home. Oh, what land, what land is this? It smells of fish, it's one to miss. <laughs> <laughs> Quick plug, that's from my latest collection, which happens to be conveniently over there as well. Um, and the second one, um, most years I go to Lexos for a couple of weeks, Greek island where of course famously Sappho <coughs> was raised and invented lyric poetry. Um, and Sappho's work tends to be found in fragments and speak, people spend a lot of time piecing it together. So this is called Sappho at Work. Sappho dips her quill, straightens the papyrus, another fragment perhaps. That'll make them think. They'll spend millennia hunting for the rest. What was she trying to tell us? All those wise professors, squinting under lights, turned on by a gay woman. Sappho grins. This is wicked, but it's fun. She strokes the cat on her lap. You're all the inspiration I need, she murmurs, feline to feline. <laughs> Okay, um, we go into our uh, lovely open mic section. I'd say two pounds maximum. I'd like to introduce our first guest from the floor today, Mr. Lantern Carrier. Cool. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a very beautiful afternoon. Good afternoon. Here at the funeral parlor, I stood over my mother's casket and watched her face. A sweetness had descended from the great void of emptiness and kissed her cheeks. On the Elysian lap of death she traveled, but love caressed her spirit, hid unseen within the stillness of her breath. What light she exuded, what radiance. The poignancy of the music touched me, and my heart remembered her fortitude, her sacrifice. My tears traveled 4,000 miles 
only to drop like dew in the sacred sanctuary. Time flew like the phoenix to the, to the eternal gate, yet my mother's essence lingered, exuding the peace of heaven. Today my soul bird cried copiously, and my younger sister, not seeing me like this before, dropped her head onto my shoulders and wept with me. There is no guide for grief, no compass, no maps, no GPS. The blind has a dog, yes, the captain his navigational charts, but love, the astrolabe of God's secrets, carves his choice hour into the emptiness of each soul. Thank you. Thank you. So that one was called No Guide to Grief. This is a Lights and Colors. A candle of brightness permeates the Venetian blinds. Clusters of luster shimmers as we kiss. Me clutching rainbows in dreams, walking on luminous horizons in paradise. She removes the traditional garment, eyes blushing through the silhouette of a naked tenderness that held my gaze transfixed, mesmerized by the innocence of intimacy, of sacred beauty. I begin to reminisce of heaven, of radiant stars, Adventure parks, a teenage girl spins with a carousel of lanterns. The incandescent moon peeps through a constellation of grandeur to illuminate her spirit. The dolphin leaps above the pool. We see translucent crystals busting into the color of indigo blue. Right now the candle burns brightly as we engage, sweet heaven kissing the flames of longing we share this night lights and colors. My mother's heart was so beautiful, so diamond-like, so vast. Much of the cost of her elaborate wedding was donated by admirers of her selfless life. Last night I roamed past the snow-white moon, past Orion, the twinkling stars, the galaxies. I saw my mom dancing, chanting her hallelujahs, bowing at the effulgent and bewildering feet of love. The candle burns brightly. I continue to walk on luminous horizons, clutching rainbows and dreams. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. London Carrier. And um, now, Frank Crocker. Thank you. Actual stations. Yeah. Fumble, fumble. Be there. <clears throat> 20, 30 years ago they started uh, doing hip hop and uh, rap, uh, but really it, it started a long time before that with comic opera, but they called them patter songs. So uh, I've got a patter song uh, about uh, a local inhabitant, local inhabitants to me. Uh, I'm gonna, I might land up sort of part, partly singing it, so because it is based on on uh, a patter song. I would really like to formulate a compact pigeon patter song. The timing must be perfect, really, not too short, not too long. With ample time to tell you how I feel about this feathered breed who land up in my garden and rob the finches of their niger seed. They defecate profusely and show no fear or modesty. They have orgies on my patio, and I have to tell you honestly, the foreplay's non-existent, the build-up's basic, and it's minimal. They have it off like animals. I really think it's criminal. You never see a baby one, I swear they're all born fully grown. When darkness falls, they wander off, they seem to know their way back home. They're underneath our arches, they don't go in for grand designs, or in dilapidated buildings that are underneath the railway line. <laughs> They're a universal menace, is there no place where they won't go? They need anything to hand that we dispose while we are on the go. From the hall to Aberystwyth, from Sydenham to Rotterdam. 
as you can gather from this rant of mine, I'm an anti-pigeon kind of man. <laughs> In the provinces, so I've been told, they have pigeon fanciers. I live near Canary Wharf, you see, which is riddled with financiers. They're not really into nature, though, though, they, though they might throw the birds a crumb or two. Much the same for all the folks who work, from Spitalfields to Waterloo. Instead of keeping cats and dogs, we should all, really all keep birds of prey. A falcon keeping guard would really keep these blighters right away. So I help you put the essence of this compact pigeon patter song. I tip my cap to GNS. That's where I got this inspiration from. <laughs> Genus, Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, uh, well, I've answered it. Okay, hello. Uh, I've answered the song from uh, the pigeon point of view in, in a more uh, contemporary manner. With a bird's in the hood and we is making it real, we can gobble up the contents of your takeaway meal. We are dowdy and grey and shop full of fleas. We is clogging up the cities both here and overseas. We seem to be immune from coughs and sneezes, bacteria, hysteria, infectious diseases. With the birds on the hood, we don't do fertility, <coughs> cautions for sparrows, because we only do virility. With the birds on the hood, and we is feeling elevated, we are a beat of animals who haven't decimated. In your cities and towns, we is really thriving, billing and cooing and ducking and diving. It's a shame about the species, what is falling off the twig, but hey, our numbers are exploding. We're really making it big. So stay with it, Mr. Human, because we're on your case. We're more, more than just a foot. To the human race. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and now, Kate B. Halls. Hello. Um, these were from my collection, which came out six months ago. There are some there on sale if anybody's interested. Right. This is about being a single parent quite a long time ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I lived upstairs to my mate who was also a single parent. I think that's sort of, well, it's self-explanatory in a way. Bar billiards. There used to be bar a bar billiards table in our local when it was called the Builders and the floor was still sticky. That was before Flo died. Sometimes we went in at lunchtime and watched her watching the one-armed man did. She was rarely wrong. Everyone thought that Flo needed the money more than them, so no one ever stepped in front of her. We would stop playing as the coins fell. If it was a big win, it was halves all round, and you never refused. If not, and someone offered, we would wonder, should we stay for a second pint before picking the kids up from school? Then Flo would go off to the co-op with her winnings, and we would spe speculate as we finished the game, whether we really did play better after a drink. <laughs> 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 autograph book. It sits on my sister's bookshelf. I check it every time I visit. Begun in Germany when she was 11, mostly written by her school friends. Neither of us understands these entries. The grown-up words and wishes added after her return to London are mostly in English. Our father took two pages with his love and a dried red rose that she probably pressed herself. We wrote rather formally when we were old enough and not before, except that one time when I was three and did a drawing. I was in big trouble, but my artwork remains. The green and orange velvet cover is worn and split and the page is loose. My sister is beginning to forget the most recent babies in the family and what happened yesterday. So, as our sh shared history is forgotten, I covet this book left to her and to my shame often think of stealing it. <laughs> oh, 
KB Hall. Thank you. Okay, to wind up the uh, first tranche of open mic points, I'd like to introduce John Hurley. These are um, a few lines about a man's futile struggle. I was at his funeral last week, but that's beside the point. <clears throat> the odds now tilted as time moves on. All Tim's efforts are curtailed. He had tried his hand to create land where even God had failed. His powerful body now bent with time. Once loved panniers on broad shoulders. The earth was poor, so he spread manure between barren, silent boulders. Always imbued with the love of land. His two acres on a hill. He was bound to fail where rocks prevail. And yet, he dared to till. He walked the shoreline daily. He would gather bladder rack. Baskets lashed with ropes, he climbed the slope, dripping seaweed on his back. Now nature has reclaimed its own, where he labored with such zeal. Does he count the cost of a battle lost? What does he really feel? It's all covered now with blossom furs. Does its beauty <coughs> suit his soul? He went the last mile, he enriched pockets of soil. In advancing years to their toll. Thank you. This is um, a little bit about my childhood, which is quite a long time ago. <laughs> and it's, I call it the bedrock. The Sunday silence always shattered by the threatening boom of our church bell. Stopped us at play, it was time to pray and avoid the raging fires of hell. We must take part in the ancient ritual. It's time to get rid of childhood ties. I have heard of heaven. I'm now age seven, so I become one of the altar boys. I can now gaze down at the congregation, look up at a priest with his outstretched hand. I become a fan of this powerful man and believe in saints from another land. He's drunk with words, so the sermon lengthens. Some people nod as if in a trance. A man's eyes close as if in repose, gets a nudge from his wife and a withering glance. Lady Lucy Ledger has come to worship, sits all alone in the family pew, Will she go straight to the Golden Gate? I'd like us. Will she have to queue? <laughs> it's the lavabo now. Priest washes fingers. Holds through to the vine in human hands. A wave of elation, a transantiation, and the firm belief that that fate demands. Thank you, John. Thank you to all the open mic readers we've heard so far.